This is Podcast Satellite. This is Prince Hanley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure love. We've got suggestions for Israel's military and government today, prophecies currently being fulfilled today, investment news for the enlightened, suggestions for any nut terrorists, and I'm going to give you four good hot tips, at least tips that look good to me on the stock market, and suggestions for the United Nations. News is not covered in the major and sometimes minor media. Israel and the Middle East at war, particularly the conditions with Hezbollah, and then we'll talk about secret war room advice for the Israeli military, news from Israel and the Middle East today. We'll also cover what's really happening today. So we're going to give you some teaching that will help you to win, not only in your investments, but in your personal life. I'm not an investment advisor, but I'll tell you what looks good to me. We're going to help you formulate a total objective global view so you can lead, you can win, you can be productive and and live. We'll also tell you how to receive guidance and direction, teaching to help you interpret the real news and formulate a worldview upon which to make sound decisions and plan for today and for the future. In the world news, we're going to cover Iran first. The August 31 deadline set by the P5 plus 1, that's the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany, for Iran's answer to the little sticks and carrots that were offered to it, Iran, as much as it has tried to confuse things and done so very defiantly against the UN, now we have the European Common Market, or the EU, opened up talks with Iran for approximately two weeks. And that doesn't really matter much because for three three years, Iran has avoided the fact that they're building a nuclear weapon. They dare free nations to stop it. And in his speech to the American Legion on Friday, last Friday, U.S. President George Bush presented four points. Number one, the Iranian regime. Number one, Iran arms, funds, and advises Hezbollah, which has killed more Americans than any terrorist network except Al-Qaeda. Number two, Iran interferes in Iraq by sponsoring terrorists and insurgents. They empower unlawful militias, and they supply components for improvised explosive devices. Number three, Iran denies basic human rights to millions of its people, the Jews, the Christians, the Kurds, and others. Number four, Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons in open defiance of its international obligation. And President Bush summarized by saying that Iran must be confronted because it is supporting terrorism, violating human rights, and seeking nuclear weapons. And finally, President Bush summarized by saying saying that Iran must be confronted because it is supporting terrorism, violating human rights, and seeking nuclear weapons. The recent suggestions of those that don't have the resolve to stand up against evil is that we should have unconditional talks with Iran. This is foolish thinking that Iran would give up its nuclear ambitions if only it could be convinced that the United States would let it keep oppressing people in peace. In other words, that we won't bother them for oppressing people. This is a stupid theory because the U.S. has done a lot better. It has actually demonstrated it. Let me give you an example. Libya, after years of very harsh sanctions imposed by the Security Council, which was unified, after the fall of the Taliban and Saddam Hussein, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi decided to convincingly dismantle a nuclear program that the West didn't really know much about. At least there was a lot more in detail than we knew. The Security Council, even after the fall of the Taliban and Saddam Hussein, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi decided to dismantle a nuclear nuclear program that we didn't know the full extent of. Gaddafi revoked terrorism and with the result that sanctions have been lifted and the U.S. has opened normal relations with Tripoli. Iran knows that the same option is open to them that was open to Libya. However, Iran does not need to do what Libya did. It scares its way out of sanctions and it develops nuclear warheads anyway. At this time, Israel, the United States, and possibly Great Britain are the only nations that have the backbone and the resolve to stop evil and evil nations.
In the world news of investments, United States stocks are expected to climb again this week as investors return from their summer vacations. Short trading week, there will be a light lineup of economic data. Usually the market does well the week before Labor Day holiday and then the Tuesday after Labor Day, at least moderately high. And there might be a small rally in some of the stocks next week, in other words, this week and the week after. Check this out. Here's three investments that might look good to you. They look good to me. I'm not an investment advisor, neither do I give advice. I just tell you what I think looks good. If the stock price moves down some, CVS Corp, that's CVS on the market, Procter & Gamble Company, PG, and Walgreen Company, WAG. Those are three you might want to do some research on and check past performance and see what you feel they might do for you in your portfolio. Now, I'll give you a stock that looks good to me also later on in this section. I'm not going to do it right now because I want to continue here. The condition of the economy after 17 consecutive rate increases, plus the level of inflation is the major concern right now. Last Friday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Standard Poor 500 Index reached their highest levels in three and a half months to the release of employment or jobs data. And the NASDAQ Composite Index ended at its best level since last June. This is good for the short term. However, in 2007 coming up, the market may be rather volatile, but not start with any giant moves up or down, plus or minus. There were a lot of economic issues which the market took care of in August in a very positive fashion. So it's a time right now and in the immediate future of settling and kind of a formation. Interest rates may be cut soon. By the way, crude oil futures closed at a five-month low with rising U.S. petroleum inventories outweighing traders' uncertainty in the standoff between Iran and Western nations over nuclear activities. Iran is playing games with the United Nations. However, what the United States does is another question that may influence influence the market great. As far as the commodities, I want to touch briefly on gold futures. They gained nearly $2 an ounce for the week. They were down on Friday, though. I want to give you some tips there. Watch the charts. If you're investing in uh, futures, draw your own charts. Even though you have all kinds of tools, as I do, for the internet, it's good to draw your own charts. I like to draw my own charts. Any contracts that I've ever purchased on commodities that I was ready to purchase, I always drew my own charts first. And let me give you a second port. Never rebuy. In other words, if you're into 10 contracts of soybean meal or cotton or whatever, and it goes up and you're doing well, don't rebuy. There's tax implications of that. Hang on to what you originally did. Get completely out before you do anything else. So never rebuy. Never go into the contracts again. Take your profits, get out, and then get back in. If you talk to your tax accountant, you'll see why I say this. Okay, now don't be fooled also by press releases of the big mining companies such as Goldberg. The increase of large mergers in the gold gold industry shows that they're they're really able to find more gold on the books of competing firms, but not much in the ground anymore. Previously, I told you that I would share with you an investment that I think looks good. Again, I'm not an investment advisor, and I don't try to invest you. I'm just telling you what looks good to me. I want to tell you about LifeCell. It's L-I-F-C on the market. LifeCell is a biotech firm. Uh, it has a product called Alloderm. Alloderm is used for cosmetic lip augmentation. It's also used in the repair of complex hernias and foot ulcers. It was 16th place on Fortune's 100 fastest growing companies in 2005. It has shown a 28% increase since then, plus it was the best performer on that list. It's a quasi-natural substitute for skin and human tissue. It's used in 20% of the major hernia procedures. It's used in post-mastectomy, breast reconstructions, and over the past three years, its sales have gone up 45% annualized and earnings up 92% annualized. So I'm looking for life sales to maintain 40 to 50 percent annual profit in their growth. One problem that you might want to be aware of, though, is that alloderm is harvested from cadavers. There's 22,000 tissue donors a year, but LifeCell harvests around 6,000 of those, so the supply is a problem. However, in the year 2007 coming up, they have a new called Xenoderm, that's X-E-N-O-D-E-R-M, and it's derived from the skin of pigs. That doesn't necessarily sound too kosher. However, Xenoderm may be the springboard for internet growth like in the field of cosmetics and so forth.
In the world news, we see a consistent cross-section of the worldview of the international community during Israel's recent war against Hezbollah. Hezbollah abducted and killed IDF soldiers in an unprovoked attack, and then they sent rockets on Israel's northern city. If this had happened to the United States from across their northern border in Canada, the United States would have responded with major force immediately. The United Nations and the majority of the world nations apply double standards to Jews. After the Holocaust, world leaders asked the Jews why they did not fight back. Now it asked them not to fight. The world is against the Jews and the media is biased against Israel. Not only during its war against Hezbollah but against any of the other enemies. Let me tell you why that is. I'm going to give you a little spiritual insight there. It's one part of this show to help you understand a proper world view of what's going on today so you can formulate a springboard to operate in the future. Satan hates the Jews for two reasons. Number one, they're close to God's heart and God said that he loved them and that he would keep the promises he made to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not just Abraham. Abraham is thought upon as the father of three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But that's just part of the story. It's the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, which is Yitzhak, and Jacob, which is Yaakov. In other words, to the Jewish seed line. And God said he would honor them and promise to bless them. Number two, Satan hates the Jews because it's through the Jewish seed line that the Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Anointed One, came to earth and defeated Satan through the shed blood on the cross stake. And now we see why there are two reasons that the world hates the Jews. They're energized in their hatred against Israel and against the Jewish people and the Zionist state also because of these two factors. They don't even know why they're doing it. I'm going to give you an example in just a moment of the great bias of the media. UNIFIL was Hezbollah's secret intelligence service. Throughout the month-long conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, UNIFIL's website served as Hassan Nasrallah's personal intelligence services. All he needed to do was log on to UNIFIL's official website to find daily, real-time intelligence about the location, the equipment, and the force structure of Israeli troops in Lebanon. UNIFIL posted precise information about the movements of Israeli defense forces, soldiers, and the nature of their weaponry and material, even specifying the placement of IDF safety structures within hours of their construction. Now check this out. New information was sometimes only 30 minutes old when it was posted, and never more than 24 hours old. At the same time, not a single item of intelligence regarding Hezbollah's forces made it to UNIFIL's website, in case Israel might be checking in. The Weekly Standard reported that a review of every single UNIFIL web posting showed that while UNIFIL was daily revealing the towns where Israeli soldiers were located, the positions from which they were firing, and when and how they entered Lebanese territory, it never described Hezbollah movements or locations with any specificity whatsoever. Now let me tie this all together for you and give you a good foundation from which to base your future. Lots of times people talk about the Battle of Armageddon, which definitely will be in the future, but not now. They confuse it with the battle described in Ezekiel chapter 38, an attack against Israel. Those are two distinctly different battles. I'm not saying this can happen, but you need to realize that the battle described in Ezekiel chapter 38 could happen right now, at this very time. No other prophecies need to be fulfilled for this to happen. Study Ezekiel chapter 38 and read it and you'll see exactly what I'm getting ready to give you details on. Notice the word of God came to Ezekiel the prophet saying, and this is in chapter 38 of Ezekiel in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, and a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, Gomer, 
all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the North Quarters, and all his bands and many people with you. Be prepared and prepare for yourself and all the company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Notice he's talking about Russia. He's talking about Rosh in the land of Meshach and Tubal, and about Gomer, Togarma, and so forth. And he talks about Persia, Libya, Ethiopia. We know that Persia is modern-day Iran, and we know that Libya and Ethiopia are different in the confines national as far as their boundaries than in the Bible description here, but it's showing that Russia will ally herself with Iran and with two northeastern African empires. Also included will be those of Eastern Europe, including Turkey. And these will come against Israel. And the Bible says in verse 8 of chapter 38 of Ezekiel, After many days you shall be visited. In the latter years you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and you shall dwell safely all of them. And then the Bible tells us a description of the very attack against Israel from Russia, Iran, and these two northeastern African empires, other countries in the Eastern European bloc, and also including Turkey. And it shows a great defeat they suffer, a terrible defeat. And you can read this and see. Now let me tell you something. It's God that draws the enemy from the north. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 4 and 5, he says he puts hooks in their jaws and leads them out with their army. By the way, direction in the Bible is always from Israel. So it, when you say that you're in the north, you're north of Jerusalem. Also, any of the following reasons God might use to draw the northern powers at this very present time we live in. Number one, Israel's present wealth, its people. Number two, Israel's scientific superiority. Number three, Israel's strategic geomilitary positioning. And number four, Israel's previous victories over Islamic Arabic factions. When I was younger, I enjoyed playing a game of Risk. Risk is a simulated military game where each opponent utilizes military forces in different geographical confines and then plans strategy from these bases as well as from any new conquered bases. I learned after several games of playing Risk that whenever I controlled Israel, I always won. So to summarize, we see in Ezekiel 38 that God is going to get extremely pissed off. He said it'll come to pass in that time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, that I, the Lord God, will have my fury come up in my face, and in my jealousy, and the fire of my wrath, which I've spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And God tells how militarily he's going to destroy Russia, Iran, the two northeastern African empires, the East European bloc, those that align themselves with Russia to attack Israel. And not only militarily, but there will be also a great rain of fire, a great rain of hailstones. There will probably be a great nuclear devastation. And God says, I'm going to magnify myself and sanctify myself. I'll be known in the eyes of many nations. They'll know that I am the Lord. In other words, just as God was sanctified in Egypt when he delivered the children of Israel out of Pharaoh's cruel bondage, where they'd been in bondage 430 years, God has said once again, he's going to be sanctified in the eyes of all the world. All those that deny the God of Israel will see that God, Yahweh, is the God of Israel. Baruch Abba Shem Adonai. This is Prince Handley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure love. You be blessed. My future and your future is in the hands of the God of Israel. Trust him today and he'll give you the victory. Trust him and he'll lead you in your investments. He'll lead you and teach you how to win because Jesus Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, is for you. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad.